So um, with that, then I will call to order the regular meeting of the Board of Selectmen for Tuesday, February 13th at eight o'clock. Um, and let's all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, of America and to the to Republic, Republic for which it, which it stands, stands, one nation, one nation under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. Okay, thank you with that. It's always a little awkward on Zoom doing that, but we- Are you in the office? Done. <laughs> huh? Are you in the office? No, I'm, I'm home. We did close offices today. Well, I'll give my update. Oh, that, yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, going into my first Lexman's office uh, update, we did end up closing offices today, just uh, and the public, just so you're aware, um, uh, it should be posted on the town website. We typically follow the state, but we also do a local assessment. Um, we do have employees that drive in from all over the state of Connecticut. And so the governor did close all public uh, um, state office buildings. Uh, because of the weather. So we kind of made an assessment this, this morning and decided it, it made sense to close uh, town offices. I guess things are very icy. Too. It was icing over this morning on the highways. There were a lot of accidents to wet snow. So we encourage everybody to stay home. Um, so, and uh, with that, then hopefully this won't be too bad in terms of snowfall, but it's looking very heavy. I don't know how it is up in North Madison, but it's a very heavy snow here and it's been kind of going nonstop for the last uh, two hours or so. Um, to be honest, I, I haven't wanted... gone outside yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, interestingly, I actually went to get my trash can because they did come around and they leave the top down. And so I wanted to get it in before <laughs> they build up with snow for the rest yeah. of the day. Uh, so I did go out. It, it actually is, a, it's very drivable right now where I am and, and not too bad, but slick, very, very slick. So mm -hmm. I would encourage people to, to stay in if they can. Um, other updates for the community. We're obviously in the budget planning uh, stages right now. The board of selectmen had one workshop. We've got two more scheduled. And then tomorrow night is actually the, um, at, I think it's six o'clock. Uh, is when the Board of Education is presenting to the Board of Finance and the Board of Selectmen their proposed budget for the next fiscal year. So if people are interested in that, that will be a hybrid meeting um, and that will be held at Town Hall, uh, Town Campus, um, and you can also attend via Zoom. So that's Wednesday night, tomorrow night, uh, a fun Valentine's Day if you want to watch uh, a presentation by the uh, Board of Ed. <laughs> Um, and then also interestingly, I just thought I'd mention the First Congregational Church has been doing a kindness campaign called Kindness, Make Kindness Contag uh, Contagious. And I just thought it was kind of a really uh, nice thing to be doing. It's being held this week. They've had some events around it throughout town. But it's really the purpose is to celebrate the town's local service organization. So across religious, you know, civic school clubs, social services, and youth groups that put kindness into practice and make Madison a better place to live and work. So I thought that was a really nice initiative that they kicked off. I think on over the weekend, they had some events in town uh, celebrating this, and they also had received a grant. So I just thought that was a really nice thing. We may have some people here uh, during public comment talking about that, but I thought that was a nice initiative. And that is it for my uh, selectmen's update right now. Um, any other uh, reports from the board? Yes, Al. Um, I'll give a brief update on the Academy Building Committee. Uh, the group had a lengthy session last night and um, um, has produced some uh, very updated pricing information, which they would love to share with the Board of Selectmen sometime soon. Great. No, I think we're all eager to hear where that project is. I know it's um, been quite an undertaking and um, they've been doing a lot of hard work on getting the cost estimates, bringing in all these estimators. And it's kind of time to, for us to sit down and see where we are. I know a lot of people are interested in, in seeing the status of the project. So um, I will be reaching out to you. I think, Al, we're going to talk to the chair, Joe Ballantyne Wright, and then we'll figure out, um, you know, we may have a special meeting for that or we might have it on our next agenda. So we're just going to look at um, uh, scheduling and note, and just a reminder too to the board, since we're, I just remembering it now, um, the hope is to have a meeting next Wednesday, right? You all can do the 21st. 
did you, you got an email from uh, Jeannie about that? Yes. It has to do with the new school, but um, I just didn't want to forget to just confirm that, that we'll be doing a special meeting on some contract awards and things. And that'll be, we'll talk a little bit more about that since they're under agenda on item number seven. So any other uh, liaison reports? I just have one thing um, from the Affordable Housing Committee. I know I mentioned it in the past, but the Affordable Housing Committee is going to be holding a community conversation in conjunction with planning and zoning. And they're going to have a special guest, David Fink, who helps out with um, some state level work with our small council of governments. And basically, they're going to present on what it is they're working on as the affordable housing group and just enter into conversation with our community members about their perceptions of housing needs and that sort of thing. That's going to take place on Thursday, February 29th, um, 6 to 8 p.m. And it will be available in hybrid format. Great. Yeah, that's a great opportunity. I know a lot of people are concerned about those issues, so it's an opportunity to come and listen and also participate in a in a in a uh, I, what should be a really good you know conversation on those topics, which are critical to the town. Uh, and we'll send out some alerts about that as well. Um, but it is on the town calendar already, I think. Um, I know I have it on my calendar. I'll make sure it's on the town calendar. <laughs> um, weekly, those weekly. Um... Just a little advertisement here for people yeah. watching, but those weekly updates that come out that tell you the meetings for the week are really helpful. Um, I use them all the time. So I, I would suggest if people are not getting those, figure out a way to get them. So, yeah, because the my community update doesn't hit on everything. Um, and the you can sign up for this weekly update on the town website. Um, and, uh, and it'll basically lay out what's happening in Madison this week in terms of meetings. And then you can always refer to the calendar as well. So mm -hmm. um, good, good suggestion, Scott, because this will be on that. So that way you get kind of a reminder. They go out uh, early mon or Monday morning sometimes. So one more advertisement, if I may, Peggy, um, the Chamber of Commerce is sponsoring the uh, Super Bowl eight which is, you know, people bring in their culinary treats downtown. Um, and I have been uh, honored to uh, to be one of the judges this year. So I'm going to be judging all these wonderful food treats uh, and tasting everybody's uh, morsels. So um, looking forward to that, working with Darren Kramer and John Seville. That's on February 24th. Oh, and one more day to get your library raffle tickets. Oh, nice. No, I think Peggy's frozen because she looks oh. like very pensive. Yes, I agree. It's the snow. <laughs> it was I my, that it was, dropped it somehow. Must, I don't know what happened there. It must have been so, my update. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, Jeannie, if you want to, it, it looks like there's no hands raised. Well, there are a lot of people online. Okay. I don't know if they are Jeannie? aware that they need to raise their hand if they want to speak. Good reminder. And we do have a lot of yeah. people on today. There are some people yeah, from think... the FCC on there. No day. So they just need oh, to. Someone uh, raise their, their hand. hand. Hold on one like second. Speak. Yep, there is somebody. Okay. All right. Hi, good morning. It's Brady up in uh, snowy North Madison, 108 Genesee. I uh, noticed on your uh, agenda that you'll be talking about the the nickel per nip program funds. I just wanted to share with you. I was at, I attended a uh, Guilford Tree Commission meeting last week, and they there they they mentioned um, the chairperson for Sustainable Guilford mentioned that they use the uh, nickel per nip funds to support their educational programs. So I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Okay, so if we have no other hands raised, uh, I'm not seeing anything. No. Okay, great. So then we will move on to uh, the consent agenda. Um, can I get a motion to approve item number nine in the consent agenda as presented? Move oh, number six on my agenda. Same. I mean, number six. 
That's number six. <laughs> so moved. moved. All right. Second. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, motion approved unanimously. Thank you. Item number six. I st I'm still drinking my coffee. So um, <laughs> uh, item number seven is an update from the new elementary school building committee. And I know we have uh, the chair of that committee, Graham Curtis, will be joining us. Um, and we also have Adam from Colliers, I think is also, is he online? Uh, so let me see. Adam, yeah, Levitis. And then um, Bill McMinn is also online and I'm not sure if Peter, Peter Anderson, but I think we've got Bill. So, and Peter yeah, Anderson is also here. Yep. Okay, great. So um, welcome everybody. Um, I know you guys have been very busy. Um, I had the opportunity to kind of listen in on some of the bid openings that you had uh, last week and the previous week. Um, so they're here to tell us where we came out on some of this and where we are on the project. So with that, I will turn it over to Graham. Great. Thanks, everybody. Welcome to a snowy winter wonderland. So um, this is one of those milestone dates. So it's always, it's always good to get bring good news. Um, I don't know if her, people heard through the grapevine, but we, we opened our bids last week and the week before for some of the trade packages. And we had excellent participation, which means we got a lot of bidders, um, sometimes four or five or six bids. Um, to, for each individual trade. So our CM is still going through the bids. Some some of the low bids were a little, might be a little suspect. People get a little hungry sometimes and they throw in a low number that's probably not in the best interest of the town to take that bid. We don't, we have to take the most reasonable bid, but they're going through the process now and evaluating, talking to the bidders, making sure they have the full scope covered. If someone like has a million dollars under the everyone everyone else, it makes a suspect that he missed something on the bid. So we're doing that right now, but it's safe to say, where we are right now, we're going to be under budget. And so we have a project that can move forward safely. So that's that's great news for everyone. And we'll we'll know the exact number uh shortly, you know, the exact number we're under, but um it's going to be, you know, in excess of uh in excess of a million dollars will be under. So which is great news. So that um, if everyone recalls when we went through this process, we um we we put a lot of alternates out there that would allow us flexibility in the bids in case we, you know, we did open under, we wanted to make sure we could award the contracts, you know, right off the bat, but we did create a lot of items that, that gives us flexibility. Some of them are probably more necessary to the job than, um, you know, more, some are must haves, but the, uh, a lot of them are, you know, optional things that we could discuss. Uh, that said, we, we know that the town did move some money over, um, from Polson to our project. And we we committed to coming back to the Board of Selectmen before we chose any alternatives. Obviously, the Board of Education uh, is going to be heavily involved. Some of these are actually uh, ed spec items that were, you know, quote unquote, must have projects, but they express some flexibility to taking them out. So it'll, it'll be a little bit of an iterative process. We will, uh, some of the ones we'll have to decide immediately because if they're if they're early on in the project, we need to know now. We can't wait. Some we can some we can defer a little bit, and some if we if we don't choose soon, they'll end up being we can still get them, but there'll be change orders. There'll be negotiated price. The price that was included in the bid package for the alternates is as a limited window to take because they you know due to escalation and things like that, they can't guarantee the price uh, necessarily. But we we can still negotiate those in. So uh, overall, so on on budget, um, also. Relative to schedule, if uh, to, to stay on the schedule always had us starting in the spring, uh, approximately March 1st. Uh, in order to do that, we, we'd like to request a special board of selectmen meeting to award some some contracts. I know there's a tentative meeting um, potentially next Wednesday. If we get that, um, Adam is working with the legal counsel, the counsel from the town on the form of the agreements. Uh, we hope to request uh, several contracts that are required to start initially, like the site contract to put up the safety fence and things like that. Um, but we, we can give you more details on that when we come to, uh, to the meeting next Wednesday. But in general, if we um, every day we don't start, you know, is a day at the end that we, you know, we'd love to have can't get back. So we're hoping to get started on March uh, on around uh, March 1st, give or take. And uh, the CM is uh, raring to go and um that's the high level overview of where we are. So um, any questions? Sounds like we'll have plenty of opportunity next Wednesday. <laughs> um, 
it just curious when so we'll have next Wednesday will be some uh contract awards right Correct. um will you then at that point have a better sense of you know some of the uh decisions or or you know recommendations for us in terms of you know what would come from bid you know bid alternates versus um how we want to handle that because I do know that we pulled money out of contingency for this so I would think that we'd still want to hold as much as we can until we get further along in the project project before we make any big decisions about you know moving money out of the project I don't think we want to do that until this is a done you know the project's done <laughs> um exactly so I, I, I see Adam had it's Adam if you want to interject oh, yeah. on some of the specific timing of these yeah, so I think that would be helpful, and that's that's where we wanted to set the scene. Uh, again, Adam Levitis with Colliers, um, serving as the Alders Rep Project Manager for the school. So uh, as as Graham and, and Peggy alluded to, um, the next Wednesday meeting will be focused on the early trades release packages and, and giving Gilbane some notice to proceed to start mobilizing the site. At that time, we likely will not yet have the the number for the entirety of the packages because we're still going through scope review meetings for some of the later items you know you don't have to have early release for the the, the person doing low voltage and things like that so uh we we can provide a summary for the board of selectmen in terms of where those packages are heading so everyone has a comprehensive understanding that yes we're going to be under budget you know to whether it's a hundred thousand here or two hundred thousand there is is de minimis, but you'll understand that value uh, roughly at the next meeting, and then subsequent to that, later in February, um, looking to sign sometime in March, will be the balance of the packages. So next Wednesday will probably be on the order of about twenty to twenty five million, and then subsequent to that would be the remaining twenty to twenty five million uh, for the other for the other trades. Um, again, those values getting confirmed now. Um, in terms of the timing on decision making, because obviously that's important. Um, next Wednesday, aside from that, that early trades package and potentially some other sub consultants that we need for the field, uh, there won't be any decision making needed on the alternates at next Wednesday, next, next Wednesday's meeting. Uh, the intent is that decisions on alternates, the, the clock would start, so to speak, once we have that full final guaranteed maximum value GMP contract price from Gilbane, at which point all the alternates will have, you know, this is the a la carte, this is the price for it, take it or leave it. And some sort of, uh, some semblance of what the timeline is, as Graham alluded to. So something with long lead items or something that comes early in construction, you might have a 30 day window uh, starting basically through the month of March when we're, we're making those decisions. Some items might have a little more leeway um, depending on the type of material and, and how far it goes out. But uh, the idea is that those between now and um, you know, sometime through March, we're, we're gathering the data, helping to make some, some collaborative decisions and, and impact with obviously Board of Selectmen is, is the, uh, the key fiduciary player, but uh, School Building Committee for Scope Project and then Board of Education for any items within the ed specs and making sure that there's a, there's a good buy-in across the town of what to do with this nebulous amount of savings at this point, <laughs> which it's a good problem to have, but now we're going to work out what, what happens with it, right? Because there's always going to be questions. And when you get two years down the road, you know, someone's going to ask, well, why do we do X with our money as opposed to doing Y? You know, so making sure everyone's part of the discussion, we're documenting it, and, and we uh, come up with a good plan moving forward. That's going to be the task for the next uh, month or so after we get the, the initial trades released and get the, get the contractors moving in the field. Um, the other uh, um, components to know, just because it's started up, you know, once people hear we're under budget, we're going to start moving forward. Uh, conversations about groundbreaking start coming up. Um, those probably that ceremony likely won't uh, happen until maybe later in March or early April, something like that. Um, once there's a site to look at, as opposed to just a few uh, contractors in the cold yelling at dirt when they first start scratching the site. <laughs> so uh, get a little more stage, get a little more uh, organized and get the, uh, uh, the potential uh, guests coming and inter invited and that sort of thing. So just to kind of put that out there, once once you start talking about actually digging dirt, usually wait you know, a month or so to, to have the ceremony for, for uh, groundbreaking. Um, other than that, uh, I think that uh, that about covers it from this sort of high level. So before next Wednesday, we'll have, you know, materials distributed and uh, have it, 
should be pretty well teed up for for the discussion and, and hopefully the approval um, at next month's meeting. Oh, what one finally comment one one item that was not an alternate, but um, that would you know we might be nice to have was solar panels on the roof. Um, I can tell you, I don't have to tell you which building committee member was advocating that we do that. If we put in solar panels, we will, uh, we can get a net zero school, which means that won't have any, uh, utility costs. So, um, if, if, uh, if at the end of the job or as we get closer to the project, if we have, uh, some money left, uh, Woody would strongly advocate that we install solar panels. We, we, we obviously, in all, we, the building is make ready for solar and we could procure it through a PPA, but as you know, with the federal funding, um, the new laws, you can actually get direct, you know, reimbursement uh, from mm -hmm. the feds for this. So it, it's the advantage of having to do a PPA has kind of gone away. But ju just want to, for Woody, for Woody's sake and his diligence and hard work on the project, I'd throw that out there. Um, I think it's certainly worth exploring that and looking at also the um, rebates associated with that, you know, and how that would work. So I think that's something worth talking about as we work through where we are with the budget on the school. Um, and I apologize if I'm kind of in and out. My internet is a little unstable I'm, because I am at home. Um, <laughs> and uh, I have I have a booster, but the booster isn't doing much better, I guess. So, <laughs> um, so um, well, first of all, I'm very excited to hear that we're under budget. Um, you know, I just want to remind people, I know that there was a, a um, a meeting last summer where the town had tried to move forward with an additional appropriation for this project. Keep in mind that they did value engineer down to cover the money that was not approved. So those costs were are, were taken out. So if we had received that money, um, that would have gone to some other things that had been part of the school package that have been value engineered out. And then in addition to that, in order to, to bid, we did have to um, use contingency funding as part of like the package that we uh, got approval from the state, which is not best practice, but we managed to squeak by, I think. So um, that's where I feel like it's not true over budget or under budget, because some of this really is money that you, you we might need in the next 12 months as we go through the construction process. And we kind of need to earmark some of them back into contingency to make sure that we're in a situation where we can complete everything. Um, so uh, but nonetheless, we're still under budget. So that's good. <laughs> so, um, uh, so yeah, so, it'll, uh, you know, I think um, unless board members had other questions, we'll probably be having another conversation about this next week in a little bit more detail. All, all good news. And, uh, you know, to think that we're on schedule and that we can actually break ground, you know, soon, that's that's really exciting. Again? Uh one one sort of general thing, and I think this I would apply this to the academy um, project as well. Uh, I am personally getting more and more questions from members of the public. What is the status? And the um, I don't want to say uninformed opinion, but but in the absence of a lot of public data, um, there is the impression that the projects are behind schedule when in fact, neither of the projects have missed any milestones, um, as I understand it. I'm wondering if a um, twice a month executive update from the two committee chairs, I'm talking about bullets, less than a page to the board of selectmen so that th that could function as talking points so that when we go out into the community and we're asked, we have high level responses to keep the rumors to a minimum I don't know. I'd like to hear what the board members think about that. Um, it would be useful. I'm getting the same questions for sure. So um, I think once a month probably would be reasonable <laughs> versus yeah. twice yeah. a month. I'm, but Well, and I, I will say we're kind of in a different stage now with both these projects. You know, I think people don't understand how long it takes to go through the, you know, hiring the 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 architect hiring the consultants, the you know construction manager, going through that process, and then going through the design development process, which takes a long time. And I think people think you know these things happen overnight, you know, and they don't, and it's a long process. Um, but uh, so now we're in the point though now where people are going to start seeing groundbreaking and things, particularly for the new school. Um, 
which is more visible. And so they'll understand that, yes, the construction is happening and the school will open, but I'm not opposed to having some sort of update sent out uh, from the committee chairs just to the whole board. Um, I think and that's I'm, I'm really talking about a couple of bullet points um, that could serve yeah. as talking talking points. I, I Not essays and certainly not trying to create busy work, um, but- right. Even just the calendar that shows, you know, here's where we are in the calendar. We're on schedule. <laughs> you know, something as simple as simple as that. Uh, maybe Peggy, and occasionally in your weekly update, you could uh, include a sentence or two on each project. Uh, yeah, that's that's a good point too. I could just put a, a bullet in, get it from the chairs, and put it in that, so it's out for the community. Um. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a good suggestion as well. So we'll figure something out. I think Bruce, um, that, so that people are just know where things are. I mean, obviously they can attend the building committee meetings, things like that, but, uh, um, okay. All right. I think that's a good, good suggestion. And did you have something you wanted problems? to say? Adam was raising his hand. Yeah. I would, uh, just point out the, the school building committee website, which, um, I don't know how, how many folks know about it, but it does have the macro schedule and it's periodically updated with the, the red status bar kind of tracking through the, uh, so the, the big milestones and things, uh, it's due for an update. We were kind of green eye shades, heads down, uh, getting through the contracts and things like that. So, um, I'll be sending out an update to the, the, the web team to post that. Not that that, you know, we're about to enter a big 15 month long bar for construction, uh, which isn't necessarily <laughs> the, the most detailed, yeah. but for the purposes of just a, an update for, you know, where are we at on this broad 40,000 foot view that that'll be updated in the, right. the next couple of days. Well, and maybe I can put a link to that too, just so people realize that there are uh, websites for the projects. I, I haven't looked at the Academy one in a while, so I'm not sure what they've been posting. I know the minutes get posted, but um, to their meetings. Um, but um, and, and I am, <clears throat> I'm talking, um, you know, about some of the comments that we've heard and certainly the, you know, the people that have come to me. Um, it, it's not a very satisfying response to say to them, well, if you go to the website, everything is there for you. Um, or attend and, a meeting. Right. Uh, yeah, and, and I think it, it might be a little more productive for us and a little more proactive if we can give them um, the talking point and then direct them to the website. You know, here's, mm -hmm. you know, here's kind of where we're at. And if you want to know more, here's where you go. Um, I think we can we can get away with that. But I don't think we can say, well, just go to the website if you want to know more. I would think too, just from a board of ed standpoint, um, Zoe and and the team there are probably pushing out some level of comms through the the Madison Public Schools channels, but you know maybe worth exploring that as well. So, yeah, and yet we have people coming up to us saying the projects are all behind schedule and never going to yeah. get done. So, and you're really only receiving the public schools news if you have a kid in the school system. So, yeah, I don't get those right. Yeah. And they don't really talk about the projects, but um, so I think we can we can try to do some push pushing out now um, on on the projects. That's not a problem. I've actually had nobody reach out to my office at all <laughs> about the status of the project. So I'm just saying it's not I haven't gotten anything. Um, but uh, I do think it's important that people know, you know, where we are in these things. And when I've been asked, I've told them, you know, the different stages that they're at. But uh, I will certainly uh, include something in the community update, and then we'll try to get a regular kind of report to the board just in the email format from the chairs. I think that's helpful. So, okay. All right. Well, thank you guys. And we will see you next Wednesday <laughs> um, for our other meeting, which I think we landed on a time. Is it 530? And that'll be all Zoom. Yep. Um, I know we have Correct. a public information session on Garvin. After you know, but we'll have our meeting and then we can join that if we want to. But I move that around. This shouldn't be too much past six o'clock, I'm assuming. It's just going through a few contract awards and then we can ask some questions. So, um, great. All right. Well, thank you with that. And we'll see you next week. Um, next item on the agenda is the um update from the Water Pollution Control Authority, uh, which is basically the 
uh, wastewater, they're in the process of doing completing soon our wastewater treatment study that we have been um, started last year, or beginning of this year, and I think we're due to complete in 2024. I keep forgetting what year we're in here. So Tom Hansen, uh, the chair of that committee, will be joining us, and um, I'm not sure. And Trent Joseph, our director of health, and then I'm assuming somebody from Weston Sampson will be on this. So we'll give it a second. So I'm going to need their name. Forward. Trent, who from Weston Sampson will be joining? Um, it would be uh, either Matt uh, Germain or John Ruvo, if they're on. Uh, but Tom and Graham are from WPCA, so maybe they can kick it off. OK, good morning. <clears throat> um, I don't see myself on the screen here. Is that do I have to do something or? Uh, we have to show video, allow video. Okay. There you go. There we go. Now we can see it. Welcome. Good morning. Thanks. Um, it's been a while since we uh, actually gave you an update on where we are with the with the study. So I'm just going to go through some some of the key uh, discussions we've had and let you know the status of where we are. Um, the, uh, the WPCA has been meeting with our consultant, Weston Sampson, and with the Board of Health, which is Trent Joseph. And um, we're, we've, we're evaluating uh, the preliminary findings and, and trying to construct a set of recommendations that make sense from a water pollution control standpoint and from a from the standpoint of being practical, affordable, and um, and uh, and easily implemented uh, with resources that we have in town, um, if you remember the uh, we, we we this this idea the, the idea of a water pollution control update um, or I'm sorry a water pollution control plan is to think about the next twenty years where where the town's going to be then um, we're we're totally focused now on on septic systems or totally relying on septic systems. Um, we have some concerns and some issues, but for the most part, uh, we're, we're going to address them as part of a, um, a recommended plan here. Um, if you remember uh, on our last update, uh, Weston Sampson gave us a presentation of what they felt were the areas of concern in town. The areas of concern are the um, shoreline areas, the densely developed areas, some of the areas that are or were mainly seasonal and are slowly coming around to being more year round. Um, these areas have small lots. Uh, a lot of them are substandard septic systems. We have a lot of what we call non-compliant repairs that are being done, um, all managed by the health department. And uh, Trent is doing a, a, an outstanding job with <clears throat> making things work in these areas. But uh, there are definitely physical characteristics um, of these areas that make them somewhat problematic. I don't know if I can share the screen. Um, and that's not what I want. Okay. Um, I don't know. How do, you, how do you share a screen on this? I just click share screen and then click share. On. Something happened. Uh, let's see. Okay, can you can you all see that? Yep. Yep. Then Matt. So not to go over this in any detail, I just want to remind everybody that we did identify uh, several areas along the shoreline: <clears throat> Circle Beach, Neck Road, uh, Middle Beach, and and these all have the same kind of problems. They're small lots. Uh, densely developed areas, some are worse than others. They're all being um, looked at as part of, no, of an overall approach um, towards more effective and more environmentally uh, sound wastewater management in the future. Um, I'm just gonna take this off now. How do you, how do you remove it now just to go back? Um, Oh, 
unshare up in the top right corner. Unshare in the right corner. <laughs> it says share. So maybe just click that again. What are you trying to do, Tom? I'm just unshare. trying to eliminate these the share screen. Um, component. Oh, just go to go down to your share screen and and click on it again, and, and and it should give you stop. There should be a button actually up on top that says stop sharing, a big red button somewhere on your screen. Yeah, didn't have that. At the bottom, <clears throat> I got a new share. You know, All right, I'm going to stop your screen sharing, okay? I can do it, and then yeah, I'll go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Did it stop it? No. Um, oh, I got it. Here it is. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, we don't have too many Zoom meetings with our group, but I mean, all I need is a little remedial education. So... <laughs> So as I say, the, the concerns in these areas are the small lot sizes, the number of non-compliant repairs that get done, which are repairs that don't quite meet the uh, the DPH code, but they're still repairs that are useful and effective, but they may be um, a little bit too close to a house or a property line, things like that, non-compliant repairs. Um, the density of the population in these areas and the quality of life issues, which really re re refers to uh, people who want to add bedrooms and uh, improve their property, but are running into the obstacle of not being able to put in a uh, fully compliant septic system. Um, so the questions we're asking ourselves is, can we continue to rely on the systems in these areas indefinitely? Will, will, uh, will the residents in this area continue to be served by septic systems in the future? We, we have a lot of issues with sea level rise. Sea level rise is um, clearly going to knock some of these properties off the page anyway um, as we move in the future because that's going to be a major um, limit on what can be developed in some of these areas, particularly on the west side of town where the, where the terrain is lower. Um, and we have, like I say, some of these persistent recurring problems <clears throat> They're not on every lot, but they're on lots interspersed within these what we call areas of concern. So we're looking, at, we're at the stage right now, we're trying to finalize our alternatives analysis. And obviously one alternative is to do nothing with no action plan. Um, we're not so sure that <clears throat> we're, we're clearly certain that this is not in the best interest of the residents or the town or environmental protection. Um, there's always things we can do that are better. And, and we have more tools at our disposal right now. And we can improve the quality of life. We can improve environmental protection um, with the resources that we have or that we can add into the program. We're looking at potentially putting in community septic, community systems with some sewers. Now, that's a very big undertaking for the town. The town doesn't have the infrastructure or the um, administrative facilities right now to embark on a program of sewers. This is something that would take a long period of time um, and it takes planning, it takes funding, uh, it takes a whole different mindset. So there's a, a process that has to go through. So um, it's feasible. But we're really not ready yet to make that as a recommendation to put in community systems. We, the town has some community systems like Legend Hill and um, uh, the one up off of Route 80, I forget what it's called. But <clears throat> they were really put in by developers at the time that the homes were built. And here we're looking at problem areas that are already developed. Um, there's very little land available um, and it would have to be a town undertaking. Uh, to make this happen. So we're not uh, really for um, sewering and community systems for 100% of these areas of concern. So what we are deciding on now is what we should structure um, as an interim solution or as a 
preliminary set of recommendations. And that is to establish these areas as what we call wastewater management districts. And in a wastewater management district, we can make useful and new um, products and repair technologies available for the people who live there. Um, we would establish a district saying that um, because they're in the district, they may be subject to certain criteria which a normal public health septic system would not be, uh, be needed, uh, need to meet. For example, the groundwater separation, um, the, the, uh, the method that we install leaching fields to provide what we call the spread of effluent um, in a diffused manner. We would also be looking at a program to over time eliminate cesspools um, what, and what we call leaching pits and other really structural um, deficiencies in septic systems. And we might do that by uh, targeting these properties at, at the time of a change of use or a change of ownership, where uh, if they have an access pool, we would require um, that they be replaced with a with a cest with a septic tank and a leaching field, more consistent with the current code and guidelines for for new systems. And um, if we don't. And as we accomplish that, it won't be like immediately, it will be over a period of time. As properties change hands, as properties change use, these systems will have to be brought into compliance with a more um, environmentally sound process. Um, and at the same time, we will begin to prepare for ultimately the installation of sewers and, and, and community uh, disposal sites, community septic systems. And when I say prepare for that, um, the district will be gathering information, they'll be identifying parcels of land that could be secured by the town for future community septic system. They'll be starting to put the process of uh, funding in place. Uh, the, the DEEP will be our partner in this. They have a priority list. Um, and the wastewater management district that, that the town runs will say, okay, this, this looks like we have to, you know, maybe in five years, maybe in 10 years, we have to pull the trigger and get some design work completed and, um, and get this process laid out for construction because it's gonna take a long, 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 long time. These projects, you, you don't start from day one with nothing as we have in the town and, and develop a sewer system with all the program requirements that are needed. The town will need some staffing. Uh, you'll need contracts with, uh, um, even if the town doesn't operate these systems on their own, if they put them out to um, private, privately uh, owned companies to operate, you know, you have to make arrangements for that. And you're not gonna come up with, oh, we need a million dollars tomorrow or $10 million tomorrow to, to put in a sewer system. The wastewater management district will serve as the oversight on these areas and begin to make way for that process to occur by identifying uh, properties, identifying service areas, um, identifying the need for planning, consultants, things like that. This will be over time. Um, and public education will be a big part of it. If you live in a, a wastewater management district, you'll be invited to participate in the uh, the process saying look we're we're thinking of sewers um, maybe five years from now um, and get some feedback on that because some of these lots and really it's only just in a couple of places um, the lots are simply too small to have any kind of an on-site solution so if we think that sewers are in the future for some of these areas, the wastewater management district will provide the oversight in moving in that direction at the same time while improving the systems that are on those lots already. And that seems to be the consensus of the WPCA and our consultants in moving forward with um, 
a real uh, implementable recommendation right now um, without you know requiring tremendous changes in the way the town operates or the way that the staff is one of the focuses was to make sure that we don't recommend a process that's going to require the town to go out and hire six or seven extra people to administer a program things like that so most of this can be done with the resources we have um but it won't be without cost because some planning and uh and uh legal costs and things like that administrative costs are going to be incurred as we move forward now we did have um and one of my favorite things that when we started this project you may have heard me talk about advanced treatment units which is an actual physical process a a miniature you know room size treatment facility that could go on these properties and greatly improve the wastewater effluent um, and and replace a conventional septic system. It, it, it seems we're not really ready to um, make that step right now in terms of requiring them. We don't feel, um, number one, that the technology um, is there for us to uh, to reasonably say that these are going to be effective and useful over a long period of time. They do require maintenance um, and they do require inspections. Um, they do require resources that the town doesn't have right now to maintain and oversight them. Um, but we will, in, the, in a wastewater management district, we will allow those systems um, when the homeowner or the property owner says, look, I have no option. I have to, I want to add bedrooms. I want to put in a system that uh, will meet the requirements. And then they can come and on their dime, propose or suggest or recommend a system that they would like to have. And um, that would be as opposed to the town requiring them to have. So these districts will allow it. Um, and that will be part of, like I say, the data gathering that occurs over a long period of time, what works, what doesn't work, but we can get involved in that process once we establish the district. Um, Tom, can I, can I sure. uh, ask you, so um, what is the timeline for your committee? Are you going to put forward a uh, basically like a formal set of recommendations to the board of steps that we take is that it sounds like you're getting close to the end of your study right you've you're, you're now you said looking at different options uh those would be formalized in some sort of report and then would your committee then make some recommendations of steps to the board yeah we we will have a a final draft report um very soon i'll let uh, matt speak to that uh, and that report will include recommendations for establishing the wastewater management districts. And within that uh, recommendation, what specific features or programs we will uh, require under the wastewater management district approach. And then that will be presented to the, to the board of selectmen. And I would suggest that we would have some kind of a well-advertised uh, public meeting format to make that presentation. Um, right, with, so, with so we would want to the... do a, yeah. Yeah. And, well, and... and I guess the question is, you know, oh, we could call a public hearing, you know, to go to, to talk about the report. Um, setting up these districts, is this, would we do this through ordinance? Is that the mechanism? Uh, yeah, it would be uh, similar to an ordinance, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, Trent, go ahead. Yeah, uh, good morning. I just want to provide some points of clarification. Um, Tom, thank you for the synopsis of what you provided. So th there is a delicate balance on what DEP will also accept um, to get the, the reimbursement, right? So I think that's where the recommendation from Weston and Samson where they're trying to find a balance that's one that's feasible, economically affordable, um, and also does the due diligence of environmental protection. 
Uh, I think there are some things that can be more immediate, and that's what you're asking about, like the local ordinance and creating a wastewater management district. And it's not, you know, Tom mentioned uh, change of use or change of ownership, and a change of ownership is hard to regulate. So there's other things that that can trigger requiring a homeowner to upgrade from a cesspool, from dry wells, if they wanted to um, put in a like an accessory structure or, or increase their bedroom count or do a building addition. Those things are already triggered now under the public health code known as the 1913B100A. So the wastewater management district can require if 1913B100A is triggered and you're on a cesspool or a dry well, and within it, it in this district, then you would be then you would have to upgrade to a traditional, you know, septic tank and leaching field. So there, there's there's levels of where of what that can mean. I mean, already now they, they already have to show a code compliant septic area if they want to do this anyway. Um, but it the district will allow for us to require them to not be on a cesspool anymore. Because again, we have to show some effort of alternative and nitrogen reduction, right, along the shorelines in these areas of concern. Um, and then the ATU systems that we talked about that he mentioned, advanced treatments, that there are some there are some pros and cons to that because technically there's some state, the state of Connecticut hasn't quite approved those, but they're also widely using Cape Cod and other, you know, areas like that. So they're, 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 that's what Weston and Samson has to come back with us to, and kind of outline the pros and cons of that process and what it looked like for the town if we went ordinance. And then I think DEP is going to want to see some future planning beyond local ordinance um, for maybe community systems or or, or sewers. That that's kind of where where we are. How do they handle though the you know some people just can't afford? I mean, a, a septic system is what fifteen twenty thousand dollars. So you're gonna we would require people to upgrade their systems. Or only if there was a change of ownership. Well, when not, not and I, it's not only a change of ownership. Change of I think change of ownership is probably the one that's the hardest to 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 regulate. I think it's beyond. I think it's more things that are related to the design flow of the building. So if you wanted to do an addition to add a bedroom or you know go up another story or put a swimming pool in, you have to show that you have a septic, a co-compliant septic area as it is now under the public health of it. There's nothing, but if you're actually on a dry well or a cesspool, you would have to upgrade that system. I mean, we're talking hypothetically speaking in a, in a wastewater management district. And that, and that is a step into a better operation. And um, there, there are things- So that would be though, I, I'm just saying, so if we were to, obviously we'll get into this later when the board looks at the, but you're not saying that we would put something in place then that would require a home, home homeowner to go out and upgrade. It would only be if they were changing use. So if you're inaccessible right now, um, it's not like the town is looking to mandate that you upgrade your your septic system immediately. Yeah, we we're not looking. We haven't, and, and I not retroactively. No, no, we that, yeah. no. Okay. I, I think if you triggered the if you're looking if you're currently on a cesspool, but then you wanted this building addition or this two-story right, garage. Exactly. So that would be the trigger. It wouldn't just be yes. us in some sort of right. Okay. Mm, correct. Well, if I, correct. if I can interrupt here, actually, Peggy, we, we are looking at that um, and uh, setting some timelines for the substandard systems to be upgraded. Um, and that's one of the, the things we're working with right now on the, uh, on the recommendations. Because although... I mean, our mission is water pollution control. It's, we're not really, we're, we're sensitive to, and we understand the need for people to have money to, to do these things, but to do nothing is irresponsible from the position of the WPCA. So one of the things I was talking about at our last meeting was setting a timeline, you know, maybe within five years, these things have to be upgraded or taken out of the ground. and. It, without that, we're really not meeting the objectives of uh, water pollution control in these areas. Now, does that mean a homeowner has to dig in and take twenty, thirty thousand dollars out? Well, there's also funding programs, and funding can be in the form of uh, DEP assistance or even town assistance. Um, these kinds of things are going to cost money, 
and they have to be done. So it's not. I, I, I would say that your 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 concern about requiring upgrades over time is a real one, and I think we're going to recommend that that be the case. The over time, so, that, that's kind of what we're dealing with right now. What what is that timeline and seasonal versus year round homes? There's a lot of caveats. But funding um, funding is going to be an issue. Funding has to be made available to assist. It's a it's going to be a municipal program, these wastewater management districts. So they in and of themselves can be agencies for funding upgrades and changes. Well, I think then um uh, the, the next I'm sorry, Bruce, are you trying to speak? Uh, I, yeah, I, I I was just gonna say that um this is a, a fabulous update and um it sounds like there are some very important policy decisions. Um, in our future um, down the road. So I appreciate getting the, the heads up um, that we're going to be doing this. It also sounds like you still have a considerable amount of um, work to do to be before where you can make some firm recommendations to us. So I think we, we look out to that. Um, again, in the spirit of proactive communication, I'm wondering if the residents of these districts that this conversation is going on, that um, you know the public hearing is is great, but I'm not sure it reaches everybody. Um, I think a lot of these properties are are still probably seasonal, um, and uh, as we formulate our strategy um, for the for the areas and our strategy for communications, maybe of that. I was thinking the same thing, Bruce, that, you know, as we dive deeper into this conversation and recommendations, that there really needs to be targeted outreach to the people in those um, proposed districts that could be affected by this. I don't think it would be enough to just have the public outreach hearing. I think, you know, we would need to send mailers to those addresses so that they were really aware of any potential changes coming to their community. Well, I, those are certainly good uh, good ideas to do. We we don't have it in a budget to, to do that kind of uh, a program. Um, that would be on us, Tom. That would be on us. That would be the board, I think, doing it um, as we start evaluating ordinances and things like that where we know exactly what you know addresses are impacted we would need to really send out a lot of notifications so people are aware of that and and to that point peggy it, it, it's really the board of selectmen they're the rule making or the governing authority so the wpca is going to make recommendations and those recommendations are going to carry the weight of dep support um so it's really going to be important that the board gets involved with planning, arranging, setting up funding, or at least committing funding for these uh, programs to implement these recommendations. Now, the recommendations that are coming out are going to be pretty uh, mild for the most part. In other words, we're not saying run pipe in the ground. We're not saying build treatment plants. We're talking about working within the guidelines of the existing public health code and really fixing things that are egregiously wrong in these uh, densely developed uh, flood prone areas. As far as the WPCA is concerned, these things must be fixed, not because they're cheap, but because they're necessary for, for water pollution to, for, to protect the groundwaters of, of the state and to make the town responsible for the, um, for the regulation and administration of all the wastewater that's generated in the town. So that's a real right. commitment and it's part of what town bodies need to do. Um, we don't have a town manager, so we have a board of a select. It's it is going to be on you guys to make this yeah, thing work. I, I think 
I think we understand that. And so that's where, you know, we, you know, the timeline of getting our recommendations is important. And then we'll set up a process to go through to uh, decide how to move forward on some of the recommendations. Um, but also we have to make sure that the public is aware of things that are going to have an impact, obviously the homeowners that are impacted by this. Um, so we look forward to the final recommendations. Um, and, and just so I understand, is that something that you're looking to provide to us and by, you know, March, April, May, and um, where you could come back and do a presentation with Weston and Sampson on the final recommendations in the report? It, what's the timeline on that? Well, <clears throat> um, we don't have anybody online here from Weston and Sampson, right, right uh, Trent? Mm -hmm. We don't. I would okay. so, we save time um, would, around April. I mean, they're basically at their budget. They they don't want to spend any more time and money on this uh, right now. So we're going to have to um, get this finished from that perspective alone. Uh, now, the public participation end of it, they haven't really done. So um, they have to respond to that, too. So I think we'll look for getting a draft report, um, getting a uh, a public meeting, and a formal presentation to the selectmen. Um, and if you want to do things like mailers or, or other, you know, you know, you can work. Trent can work with you on that. But um, well, let's, let's say I guess that that is more the board as we take the final report and then start evaluating steps that the board would take to enact some of those recommendations that would be on the board. Um, so I think, um, okay, well, I will, uh, we'll I'll talk to Trent about it, but I think it would be good to have like a final presentation. They've only presented once to us, I think several months ago about what the recommendations of the report are. Um, and then we can kind of take it from there. I know it's been a lot of hard work that you guys have put on, in on this over the last uh, 12 to 18 months. So um, I'm sure you're gonna be <laughs> eager to hand it off <laughs> to uh, the Board of Selectmen, um, but um, appreciate all the hard work. Well, the, the Board of Selectmen can also serve as the administrative um, body for uh, these wastewater management districts. And that's probably the best way to do it because I don't think um, the other departments of the town, you know, whether engineering, public works, health, really have the resources to um, to devote people to do that. But I think you'll have to uh, think about that also. Well, this is terrific. Thank you very much. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Uh, for all the work of your commission and uh, we look forward to the final product. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Okay, great. So Jeannie, I think we also had Graham and Bill on here, which um, you can, no offense, Bill, but, and Graham, but um, <laughs> um, they're, they're kind of a hangover from the previous topic. So, <laughs> but you can remove, um, Tom and uh, Bill yep. and Trent. Okay. Yep. Are you, it, it, okay, great. Um, okay, great. Well, thank you. Obviously, there's going to be a lot to talk about. There are a lot of, uh, you know, important decisions the board will have to make and also a lot of uh, public discussion on these things, on the recommendations. Um, moving on to item number nine um, is a presentation on tree conservation, preservation, and sustainability on town and private land. Um, and just to give a little background, um, Fran attended a meeting that was really kind of more of a, a group of concerned citizens that came to me a couple of weeks ago um, that they were very concerned about some of the tree removals at the Winter Club. Um, and obviously over the last 12 to 18 months, we've been seeing a lot of tree removal activity because of Eversource. We had the issue with River Road, and then now we've seen some significant cutting along the transmission lines in town um, as Eversource clean, clears out clear cuts, basically, their right-of-way, which is not anything that the town regulates, um, but it's been concerning to people. Um, and so um, Fran 
came forward with a presentation that I think highlighted some interesting ideas about how the town might be more proactive in trying to manage tree removals in town. Um, these are some ideas and suggestions, but I thought it was worth the board at least uh, starting the conversation about. Um, and then I know so he's also given this presentation, the plan of conservation and development, because some of this really might relate more to how they can regulate in terms of development plans and things like that and taking into account um, tree removals as part of those development plans, um, which was the case of what happened at the Winter Club, because that was part of a approved development plan um, as that project moved forward. So with that, I will turn it over to Fran um, to share his presentation. And you can screen share, I think, Fran. Yes, I can. Uh, first, I want to start with a a pop quiz on Madison geography. Do you know where that is? That's up in North, uh, is it Race Hill or? You, you got it, no. you got it. It's yeah. the, it's right off, right down my street, basically. They're, yeah. uh, the, the, the pots are out now and they're collecting uh, maple syrup as, as we speak. So uh, I wanna thank the board for allowing me this time. I'll share my screen and go to screens. I probably door knocked there. That's why I recognize it, Fran. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> well, I think it's one of the more uh, prettier pictures. It's beautiful. Of, yeah. Of trees. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's beautiful. So as Peggy mentioned, this is uh, meant to be a discussion uh, with some suggestions on how we can be more proactive. And what better time than now to be more proactive as we're writing up our plan of conservation and development and, and after we've already written our strategic plan. I think there's a lot of uh, suggestions in there that we can uh, uh, build on. So the agenda will be quick. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of background on why these citizens are concerned, why I'm concerned. I'll talk about the state of resources and what other towns are doing. And finally, some recommendations and next steps. Uh, in terms of background, I think everybody has experienced a tree problem in one way or another, whether it was um, from the bugs, from invasive species like gypsy moss, and now the spotted lanternfly is on, on its way up here, uh, to the new one, beech leaf disease. Um, we have a lot of beech trees and they're all showing the, those stripes. And we not a lot of us don't even know what, what, what that means yet. Um, the, there's work being done at UConn to try to understand it and try to pretend, potentially um, resolve it. But of course, the, the, the most visible we, that we see is the Eversource work that goes on. And there's probably not a lot we can do other than maybe do a better job of communicating. And, you know, we, and that's always an answer. We always can do more with regards to communication. Um, and, and that really hits the last one with, uh, this is the Winter Club, the 20, 251 Boston Post Road. We saw, uh, this is actually screenshots from Google Street and from their own um, drone. What it, what it used to look like and what what's happened uh, with the with the clearing. So we, we know all this, and this 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 actually was the um, the straw that probably broke the camel's back when having to drive on Post Road and see this happening. It really triggered a lot of um, uh, emotions amongst our uh, residents. And, and maybe I will make one point before I go away. I, I I moved here in 2010, and and my real estate agent purposely told me to drive on this, past this street, on this street from Guilford into Madison on purpose. She wanted me to see how beautiful the tree gateway was in this particular area. So it just, it's, it's, it's coming back to me, you know, in, in how I chose Madison to live. So, so I just want to mention, I just want to make one statement though about the Winter Club, because I know there was some, um, concern about that the there were several reasons that there had to be uh, a lot of tree removal one is a lot of the beautiful trees up near closer to the road there's a very big state right-of-way and the state of connecticut um had required the homeowner or the uh a property owner to remove a bunch of trees because of the sight lines and changes that were being made to the driveway so that is a permitting process that did not go through the town but it went through the state of connecticut they're also, because this is going to be a very large restaurant, they had to put in a much larger septic system. Uh, tree roots are not good for septic systems, and so they did have to do some tree removal there. There was a plan approved, and there is a landscaping plan approved for this project that the uh, uh, Planning and Zoning Commission had approved. So 
not to detract, obviously this did raise because it is a beautiful thing. So it was, um, but I do want to for the record, make make sure that people understood that this was had gone through planning and zoning, and then there had been some approvals, and there was some things that the property owner had to do in order uh, to move forward with their project. But uh, but go on, Fran. Well, what I didn't put in the presentation was a, about a mile west, a homeowner had clear cut one of their properties on Boston Post Road um, to the to the surprise of their of their neighbors. But uh, tree cutting is is a concern. And um, and process is a concern too. So let me let me continue. Um, so far, I, I, we, we look at the history of of how we've been looking at nature. Uh, we've done a pretty good job of documenting, at least writing down our thoughts. And in fact, in 2010, our former tree warden Bob Kupta was asked to do a treescape, a streetscape uh, tree survey of Boston Post Road, and he found over he found hundreds hundreds of trees that were at least four inches in diameter or DBH, which is a diameter at breast height. Um, at that time, he recommended that the town should have a tree ordinance and that there should be a tree advisory commission or a tree advisory board. Um, some of that ideas were put into 2013 and page 14 and page 80, there was tasks talking about, hey, we should regulate clear cutting we should protect tree canopies. These were documents from the town that was put in uh, and it still exists on the town site. The most latest plan of conservation and development, policy D specifically talks about the management of trees and having forest management plans. Uh, finally, it's in the strategic plan as well. Why? Because so many of the people that you interviewed acknowledged that um, th the natural landscape of this town is a great draw for uh, people, it's a great um, economic uh, development uh, enhancement. It, it's a, it's just good for the town and good for property value, et cetera. But current resources, we have uh, we have a tree warden, but um, he, he's overworked. He's got multiple jobs. He's in charge. He, he's, he has uh, beach and rec responsibilities, and um, it's it's probably not enough to handle what, what, what we're going to be proposing with regarding a tree ordinance. We also had a conservation commission who was in the past when I was involved in the conservation commission, we were routinely asked by planning and zoning to review, uh, let's call them delicate uh, development or projects. Um, and and the, the, the project on on Boston Post Road, the winter club would have been one of those, but guess what? We, that, the conservation club has not been asked, even though it's in their remit or it's in the planning and zoning remit or in our town remit, that they may be used as a technical advisor. They may be, uh, not that they shall be, but they may be. They have not received a single request for technical advice in more than a year. And I think it's actually closer to three years. Um, our other resource is, as you mentioned, the, people speaking up. And there are a lot of upset residents about what's going on with trees. We have people taking a positive approach like Mad for Trees, where we have been able to give away a small amount, 363 trees, but I'm afraid, you know, trying to replace legacy trees, like what we have on Boston Post Road with a, a tree that two little five-year-olds can carry is gonna not really cut the mustard. We put out a, um, well, the residents have put out a, a, um, a change.org petition to try to bring um, this to light to the residents. And it was two weeks ago that it was started. And within 36 hours, we had 150 signatures. Within two weeks, we had 320. And as, as, as of this morning, there's 327. So there are people concerned about uh, what's, what's happening. So, why don't we have a tree ordinance? <laughs> you know why? I mean, I don't know why, because when you look, I did a, a survey of as many of the towns in Connecticut as I could. I came up with at least 30, and, and most of them along the shoreline have tree ordinances. Many of them have tree advisory or tree um, advisory boards or, or committees as well. Um, so, Large cities like Middletown, Milford, they have it. 
They have they have tree ordinances as you would expect. Uh, but even small towns, Essex, Clinton, Essex has a great tree commission. They they do a fantastic job. Um, our neighbor, Guilford, I was, as I mentioned, I just I was there last week. I sat in on their tree commission meeting. They had Eversource present. They talked about the current maintenance that was going on in Guilford. Um, the, the tree warden was there, um, Kevin. Uh, Kevin also is not full time. He has other jobs as well. So it's 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 uh, it, it can be done. Um, there were members of the committee. There was five or six people there. So it was a very active and uh, proactive group. Their mission primarily is to plant and re and replace trees, as well as keep the public informed of what's going on, particularly now with Eversource's projects. Uh, Durham to our north um, is more rural. It does not have a, a um, just for completeness sake, they do not have a tree ordinance. Uh, but when you go through um, the records, there's standard um, ordinance practice out there. Hartford has a great one. Guilford has one. There's even the Arbor Day Foundation has guides to how to build a tree ordinance. So uh, we've been looking at that and trying to put one together. Uh, just for best practice, I point out Hartford, who has a tree removal policy where they look at not just public trees or what they call city trees, but they look at trees on private property where they're big, mature, greater than 13 inches. In terms of re uh, replacement, and I know uh, Peggy, you and I have talked about the three for one policy that I wish we had. This is even better. What Hartford does is a inch for inch. So if in some PNZ project where the developer has to remove a big 24 inch tree, because you know they have to expand or something, that's great. That developer or owner has to replace that with the equivalent of 24 inches of tree. So 12 two inch tree somewhere, either on that property or better yet in a place designated by the town, either one of our parks, you know, some designated area for these excess trees, or perhaps they just give, they don't, they uh, give the, the cash equivalent into the tree fund to help support the projects that our tree warden and our tree commission are going to want to do. These, this is not new. This is not my idea. These are ideas that are being used today across Connecticut. So I want to have three main recommendations. The first one is the tree ordinance itself. There's some key elements that should be in there. There should be mandatory involvement by the tree warden. Um, the conservation commission should get more involved with uh, P and Z applications in particular. And it should be based particularly when there's large trees involved. Um, we should have a, we have some beautiful trees and we have, we have some list now that uh, document these notable trees. I think we need to make them a little bit more formal and these should be registered in with the uh, Connecticut College Arboretum where all Connecticut's major trees or information is kept. We should also have a permitting process on all public trees and I'm, I'm advocating for private trees that are greater than a certain, certain diameter. I think there obviously are always emergency exceptions. These are always in tree ordinances. If there's a tree that needs to come down, it can come down. I mean, we don't want to uh, have, you know, safety is a top, top uh, concern. But then there should also be replacement, and that should be based on the inch for inch rule. I mentioned tree account. This is, a, a, um, this is an interesting public-private collaboration. It's sort of like, it's sort of like, um, the town of Madison and, and Mad for Trees collaborating on, on um, donations from the public. Uh, maybe there's grants that can be acquired from the state. All this can go into a, a controlled fund that can be used to help uh, education and, and tree replacement. And of course, there should be penalties and violation and an appeal process. So that's the tree ordinance, key elements. Um, the responsibilities of the tree warden are, are clearly um, outlined and I'm sure we're following them in the uh, state's general statutes. Um, they're outlined in, in, in these sections shown here. But basically, it involves the uh, care and control of, of large trees, even shrubs in some cases on, on public property. It talks about how to enforce the, the law. Uh, it gives guidelines on removal and pr pruning hazardous trees. It has public hearings for tree removals, which we do, which we did for Railroad Ave re recently and River Road. Uh, manages for tree, manages the budget itself, maintains the, the, the list. And, and by the way, before I go off of that, I'm sorry. Um, 
he he doesn't have to do it all by himself. There's there's a, a, a the committee. It's the tree advisory committee can assist in all these areas and be um, be his uh, support group. The last recommendation is this uh, advisory committee I, I was talking about. It's a volunteer committee. Um, it, it could be normally, you know, as you do, assign residents uh, three-year uh, terms. They work together with the tree warden to do a number of things, help create the, uh, the notable tree list, provide education, um, authorize and identify areas to plant trees on public property, on po Boston Post Road or on, um, well, you know, with permission from the state as well, where we're required. This is this is done every year in Guilford. Um, and tasked to um, to help involve residents with groups, get them communicating and talking with Eversource, with planning and zoning and with del developers. So they hear us, they understand our concerns and they compromise or they, they make adjustments. It's a more formal process. Here's what I'm proposing, Board of Selectmen, that one, we, we begin drafting an ordinance and I have a team already selected, if you wish, add others to the group. But here we're talking about experts in uh, ecology, Heather Crawford, the chairwoman right now of the Conservation Commission, our current tree warden, our former tree warden, I'll volunteer, and James Norgren, who is a uh, qualified forester, who better than him to have um, on this ordinance writing team? And I'm proposing that we this team can work hard and quickly and have a draft to you by Earth Day next uh, in two months. And then I would like to hear back from the, the board quickly after that as to the, their thoughts about it and their recommendations or next steps. So we're here to help. Um, we can lead the effort in writing the ordinance. I've already written a lot of it. Um, we can staff a tree ordinance committee. We can help you with that. And you know, there's gonna be a lot of side benefits, benefits that you've asked for, not just written down and, and, and we hope would happen. We can help make a lot of things happen. The natural resource inventory obligation that we have under the uh, mission of the Conservation Commission. We can help with that. We can help drive education as listed in the in the plan of conservation and development. We can help you achieve silver status with sustainable CT. And we can help you um, become a tree city. There are 19 tree cities right now across Connecticut. With, given our trees, we should be right there as well. And we can help also maintain the desirable character that our town has and help retain its property value. So please, you have to consider all this because it's not going to get easier. It's not getting easier. Climate change is making storms more severe um, and, and it's going to make we more complicated. We need rules. Right now, it's almost ad hoc. We need more rules. And I leave you with these notable trees that um, we have across our town. Uh, right on Green Hill Road by the school in Redditch Park and the, the former Elizabeth, we have this beautiful black walnut, but drive a little bit further and you'll find that we're missing some notable trees as well now. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Fran. As always, that was a very uh, thoughtful, you know, and um, concise presentation too about action and items that the board could take under consideration. So I appreciate all the work that you put into that. Um, so I guess I open it up for discussion. Um, you know, do we want to move forward and have these conversations? Let and let Fran's team come back with some proposals. Um, thoughts from the board. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's a no brainer. I mean, I think it's a conversation that's happening across the town right now. It's visible to the town. Um, and uh, I think we're hearing um, sort of a, a cry for help, um, you know, across the community. And uh, I think we've got an active group of citizens here ready, able and willing to help us out. Um, we should we should engage them. I think the one concern I have is, you know, potentially the budget impact um, 
you know, relative to the tree warden and, you know, his, you know, other responsibilities. So, you know, that is something that we will have to wrestle with probably uh, over time. May, may I, one of the reasons I showed you that uh, town comparison at the bottom, I showed you the demographics, uh, the average income per resident, um, smaller towns than us budget for this and they, they can do the job. We're a big town, maybe require the whole spectrum of possibility is there and other towns can do it. We can do it. Yeah, maybe Think there's steps that we can having, take here too, Fran, right? I mean, maybe it's a, you know, walk before we run type of thing, get an ordinance in place. And then over time, there's yeah. the budgeting component to it. Right. Sorry, Bruce. Yeah, no, I, I was going to say, I think if the group wants to take a stab at, at fleshing out an ordinance, that would be, I think, productive for us rather than talking the abstract about, you know, what we do and don't want to do. It gives us a, a document that we can react to and, and decide i think you know there's a couple of areas where i have concern but but maybe the ordinance that they're anticipating would address those concerns right out of the gate so rather than fret over hypotheticals right now um, as far as as a commitment to, to board action i think um you know probably we're not prepared to to do that or at least i wouldn't be prepared to make a commitment to a hard um, response deadline. I think we need to take the information and consider it, then um, move forward in, in due course. Yeah, I think it makes sense, uh, you know, for the board to look at a proposed or, you know, draft ordinance from Fran and, you know, his group and, you, you know, for us to discuss that and take all aspects into consideration. I think as selectmen, we 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 know what gets our citizenry worked up and passionate. And um, I would put trees in the top category, along with uh, the beach and other things, as things that folks really feel strongly about. And um, um, I like the fact that that uh, Fran is prodding us to do more. And I think uh, uh, we as selectmen have to figure out the right balance of of uh, uh, what, what we can and should do, but um, I would like to con uh, have this continued on our agenda as um, as uh, something we want to work on, and it ties in so nicely with the strategic plan as well. So, um, oh, uh, one let's... question. Go ahead, go ahead, Al. I was just going to say, let's do what's right for our citizenry and for our trees. Uh, uh... One question for you, Fran. Um, would you expect the ordinance to cover recommended um, stewardship practices for forested town land and forested land trust land um, mm -hmm. or e even water company land? Uh, good question. Um, or, or, would you, the... or would you consider that a policy that, that stands outside of the ordinance? Um, very good questions. Um, definitely for our own town public land, including our high schools, uh, our schools. But regarding water property, I doubt it, uh, but I don't know for sure, but I really doubt it. Um, and Ma Madison, uh, for the land trust, I'm sure we, we wouldn't have, we would not have jurisdiction over that. Well, and would we, uh, I, I, I could definitely follow up on that. Um, one thing we, we definitely can provide is education and information so that if, if the land trust doesn't already know, we can help provide them with extra information. Whether we can regulate their land, uh, I would have to look into the uh, governance of, of that. But good question. Well, I mean, because the, the dynamics at play in a, a town forested property are not any different than the dynamics of, of any other forested property in the town. Right. And I know that in um, some of the bigger cities, even the smaller ones, they have forest areas designated and they have separate clauses for those special areas. Like there's, we would have something for for Rockland, you know, that would describe what needs to be done up there perhaps, or in land trust, I, I'd have to look into it more. But Wonder it does too, make could sense. You, could, could you, you know, uh, signal some guidelines 
um yeah. you know as opposed to maybe hardcore rules and 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 you know inside an ordinance too to other property owners i particularly when we're talking about invasive pests or diseases if it's starting to spread we should all be working together with the same rules about how we manage it if it can be managed if it's so large in a land trust property maybe they, they just don't have the resources but at least we can alert when there's a crisis happening like the spotted lanternfly, we, we're going to need to have, a, you know, a, a, a coordinated approach with that. We're in New York City, saw them, many of them this summer. Mm. You stepped on them, right? You got squished. Mm -hmm. I sure did. <laughs> Good. Sure did. Good. Um, so I well, it sounds like obviously, Fran. Um, you know, we would encourage you to move forward, your your working group. Um, and I, I will say that Al hit it on the head, though. I think this is a balanced approach. Um, as somebody, and I talked about this in the public meeting, one of the biggest complaints I get to my office uh, on a regular basis is about trees, but it's not about saving trees. It's about trees that people want removed or uh, branches removed or, and that's really what our tree warden's primary responsibility right now is to go around and evaluate trees that might create hazards in the town right away uh, along roads or on town property. And that's really what his job is right now. It's not to deal with pri uh, uh, private property. Um, so we would have to think through the, the different roles and that would require you know staffing and everything else. Uh, but also balancing that, um, you know, we have people with a lot of trees on their property, and I don't think the town is really wanting to get involved in permitting individual tree removal for people who want to make changes to their property. Um, I think at least that's my my impression right now. I think that is a huge undertaking. We have a lot of trees in Madison. We have people with large properties and lots of beautiful trees. Okay. So I think that trying to take this more from a like walk before we run, focusing more on development and um, and overall best practices and education, I think is probably the best way to start this conversation. Um, and I know that's what you and I have talked about, um, you know, and, and it ties in well with the plan of conservation development. Zoning is going through writing its regulations so that there is a an additional review perhaps at the approval process level, you know, for projects. Um, um, that takes into account trees because there's no formal way to really do that. Um, and um, but I'm eager to hear what the ideas are. And I think we it's always good to learn from our neighbors and our other communities. So I know you're digging into probably the actual ordinances just because there's an ordinance. It might be a meaningless ordinance or it could be a commission that doesn't really have any authority. You know, so understanding the layers, I think. Um, I think that would be helpful for the board as we go through this too. like what other towns um, you know, similar like ours that have a rural component, you know, um, to it, it rather than a city because cities obviously are in a different tree management position um, because they don't have as many trees <laughs> um, I, 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 and they just have parks. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, will, I will make a point, though, that most of the tree ordinances uh, are decades old. They, mm -hmm. they were written over 20 years ago, some 30 years yep. ago. In fact, uh, last week at the Guilford tree meeting they were rewriting theirs so yeah okay the, the old ones are old uh but i'm i'm optimistic though that we can take a balanced approach given our um you know the amount of trees the private versus public there are qualifiers that can be used there's ways we can approach it that will be reasonable mm -hmm. and balanced and, and something we can do today is allow the conservation commission to review projects for god's sake that's, well, that's already, so. I, that's, that's their mission is to help. <laughs> well, and I think this is where, as we talked about at the public meeting, we're going through the ordinances. I've actually met with, for every board and commission in town. And I've met with the conservation chair to talk about um, their commission, their role, you know, and what they would play in terms of approval process. But keep in mind, as we, these are volunteer commissions, a lot of times there's no qualifications to sit on these commissions. And so when you put in a commission that has regulatory authority, you also put another timeline into an approval process. So we have to think through that whole, you know, how that works. Um, and then also make sure that we have commissions that are adequately um, staffed and have adequate volunteers so that they can achieve quorum and they can meet their regulatory obligations. So I, I, I'm just asking yeah. that 
I'm just asking that the may yeah. be be used. That's yeah. all. Yeah. I'm, no, I'm not no, saying I understand there's, that. there's no we, there's we, no regulatory. There's no regulatory involved. It's right. their suggestions. I, I understand, but I guess there, for some reason or not, that hasn't been part of the process lately. Once you build them into the process, you have to factor that into a whole timeline of, of, of a project. And so that's where that discussion, I think I've talked to Heather about this. We're going to work on that clarifying when they're used and how. And, and I think this is a perfect example about the trees and, um, and making sure um, that that is part of that conversation. So, um, so I think that's all good things and it's timely because they're going through POCD is going through their plan as well as they're uh, looking at their own regulations right now. So I think it's a very timely thing. Um, so if there's no other comments by board members, I think, um, we appreciate the time and effort and look forward to, um, you know, coming back to us with some proposals. If you would like to have like an, uh, an, uh, you know, meeting with, um, uh, myself. And then I was thinking maybe Jen is the planning and zoning liaison, you know, you know, to, to get some more feedback and things like that before we bring something back to the board, we could we could help out your your working group. Jen, I'm volunteering you. <laughs> so, <laughs> Fine, <by me. laughs> um, but I just thought we could do that too, so that when it comes to the board, at least you you've been able to factor in some of the concerns that other board members have. So we're not you're not starting from scratch when we when we have that next conversation. Ex excellent. I'll bring the coffee. Okay. <laughs> well, I think I think just just to build on that though, Peggy, if you know Bruce sort of alluded to it, if there are are concerns, let's share them in advance so that we don't waste people's time too. So, um, it, you know, it's two way conversation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think if any board members have specific things, you know, you can um, relate them to me and to Jen, and then we'll make sure that we're somehow addressing them one way or the other when we meet with uh, Fran and his working group. Okay. Great. Thank, okay. Well, thank, thank you. you very much. Appreciate the yeah. hard work and um, I look forward to this going to the next uh, step. Um, all right. Item number 10 on the agenda is um, discussion of the disposition of the Connecticut nickel per nip program funds, which is the NIP funds. Um, and basically this was passed when they updated the bottle bill where the town gets essentially uh, a, a nickel per those little tiny liquor bottles that are sold. Um, every time they're sold, the town, if it's sold in a liquor store in town, we'll get, we get a nickel for that sale. And it's really, there's some guidelines from the state about how we're supposed to use that money. Um, and I think is Stacy on? Cause I know she was going to help. We had some data on how much money the town has collected. And then I think I just would like to get some, thoughts from the board about how to use this funding. And it kind of follows very nicely on the tree conservation discussion. Um, so far, we've just used some of it to fund green up cleanup. Um, and I've also had some requests from like the Daniel Hand Eco Club, which would like to do a project with it. Um, and then we've also had conversations during the budget process, is, is this money, should we use this to offset the cost of the hazardous waste uh, disposal fees that we uh, um, the town incurs um, when we have those on-site um, uh, days where people residents can come get rid of their hazardous waste that the, the town gets charged for that um, it's definitely an unpredictable stream because we don't know how many people are going to come and what kind of things they're going to bring um, and so it's been a bit of a, a, a um, budgeting you know, conundrum for us at times to cover that hazardous waste thing. So, um, so I thought, uh, Stacy, I know you had some data. If you wouldn't mind, like how much we've collected and how much we've spent so far. And I think you're muted. Yes. Sorry, I was. Uh, yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. So on the NIP, we have. I'm looking, sorry. Oh, here it is. We collected in fiscal year 22, one payment. We get two payments a year. We collected $4,000 um, in fiscal year 22. Last fiscal year, we collected $9,700. And so far this year, we collected $5,200. So it seems to be two payments at total 
about nine or ten thousand dollars. Um, so total revenue from the start, we have about nineteen thousand, and we've only spent about two thousand. Okay, um, and First so it's question, about she was buying seven hundred nips a day. <laughs> You'd be surprised. What, the, the numbers that we received in the packet is seven hundred nips per day in Madison. It is almost beyond belief. Mm -hmm. Um. So what you know, and I and I see it. You know, I I have a pond across here, which we have a lot of walkers, and we also have a lot of cars that drive by, and it's amazing what gets tossed out the window next to the pond. Um, nips. Um, it used to be I'd see floating paper bags, all the or, or plastic bags, and the fantastic thing is the ban happened, and we don't see those things floating around in the air, those plastic bags, hardly at all anymore. But the nips are there, and people aren't disposing of them properly. Um, so I think that you know I think I'm supportive of continuing to fund our green up cleanup, which is a big you know people go to different parts of town and they end up collecting a lot of nips when they when they do those garbage pickups. So I think it makes sense to fund that. I would like to be able to fund some of these educational or small projects that I think the eco club you know we're talking five hundred or a thousand dollars or something like that for different projects, and I thought that could be something they come. Uh, to either maybe through youth and family services um, to make a request for different things and and staff would just approve that that's an acceptable project. Um, my thought was doing that and then using uh, the hazardous waste, um, you know, uh, using the rest of the money for that. So that, that was kind of the thinking, those three tiers, you know, so we got like a bucket of three things that we would just dip into that money at times to fund. I don't know if the, if yeah, you, if I... the thoughts... Uh, yeah, I am a big fan of supporting the hazardous waste part. I mean, we're talking about just an a, an increasing dilemma with solid waste. And the more difficult it is to dispose of hazardous waste, the more likely it is to end up in a regular old trash can. And, and, and we don't want to do that. Um, you know, once upon a time, some of this could be taken care of at the transfer station. And I don't know if this is an opportunity for us to combine forces with Guilford and combine revenue streams and 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 recreate some of that capacity back at the transfer station, um, or it's just standalone like we did at the at the town barn. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's it's a good use of that money um, and solves a very serious problem. Mm -hmm. Any other board member thoughts? No, I mean, I know we discussed it briefly uh, last week, but I'm supportive of putting the NIP funds into those buckets that you presented, Peggy. Okay. Same. Good? Yeah, it sounds, sounds like a great okay. use of funds. <laughs> Okay, I just thought it was worth bringing up because I've had residents sometimes email about it as well, like how we're spending the money. So, um, so, you know, the, the I'll just put our primary goals are educational, uh, youth education, particularly the townwide green up cleanup program every year, and then the hazardous waste collection, which a bulk of it will go to to cover the hazardous waste. And just so the public understands, we're going to be bringing back the um, annual hazardous waste collection here in Madison. So you, you can always drive to New Haven and use the facility there. The town still gets charged for that. Um, but then on top of that, we, we wanna fund where people can have a convenient time to, to do it locally um, for people who can't get to New Haven. So, and just so the public understands it's been very er erratic in terms of usage and the costs have gone up quite a bit over the last couple of years to dispose of hazardous waste. And that's why we were kind of struggling with this and we had cut it last year, I think out of the budget but recognize that a lot of people were very upset about that. And we want to make sure it comes back and this is a possible funding for source for that. So, um, so that's really why I put it on the agenda just so that we have a good discussion and we know what we're doing with this money. Um, you know, and it may be eventually this will turn morph into something else if the legislature changes and actually puts a, a, um, a deposit on these things or something or bans them. Um, you know, it is, it is amazing. 
uh, these didn't exist like 20 years ago, did they? The nips, like it was only like on airplanes <laughs> that you saw these. I just don't remember. Now it just seems like the common thing, um, um, you know, and every type of, uh, they're sold everywhere now. So um, if there's no further questions, we're good. Okay. All right, great. So we'll we'll every once in a while keep give you an update maybe on what, you know, how we're spending the money, but those are going to be the buckets. So um all right, item number 11 is actually an action item. So I'll read this. Um item number 11 is discuss and take action to award a contract to BL company not to exceed $40,000 for the additional services not included in the original scope of the proposal for replacing the low voltage distrib distribution panels of Polson School as part of the electrical power and distribution upgrades as funded in the original uh, town referendum and to authorize the first select woman to sign all contracts and documents associated with this award. I'll move. Second. Second. Okay, great. And like I said, this is just the, the uh, they're adding the scope and the money is already accounted for through the budget, through the referendum projects. Any additional questions? No? Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Motion passes unanimously. Item number 12. Um, discuss and take action to approve a line item transfer of $18,925 to facilities professional technical services line item from facilities salary administrative budget line item to support the continued professional services, the interim construction manager pending board of finance approval. So moved. Yeah. Okay, this is basically um, because this department, we already had a line item transfer. I think the, um, the board or the, the, um, Departments can do up to, is it $20,000 um, without going to the boards? Um, but this has to do with um, our construction manager. We've been using an outside um, a uh, outside contractor for it. Um, and then the position now with the new facilities director coming on board, he will be hiring a permanent construction manager, which has been in the budget. But this is just using the money to pay the, cons the, the contractor right now. Any additional questions on that? No. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Bruce, you good? Yep. Great. Yep. Aye. Yep. Okay. Great. All right. Item number twelve passes. Um, item number thirteen. Uh, discuss and take action to amend the January 2022 2024 approved calling of a public hearing on Tuesday, February twenty seventh, twenty twenty four, at seven p.m. in the auditorium of Polson Middle School. 302 Green Hill Road for the purpose of budget presented to the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Education conducted by the Board of Finance in accordance with the town charter by changing the venue to the town campus, eight campus drive, room C, Hammond Asset Room, and on Zoom. So moved. And so um, this just was, you know, we're, we're trying to do these hybrid now, um, any of our public hearings. Um, we can't do voting town meetings that way because we can't ha offer uh, hybrid voting, but we're trying to do any kind of public hearing. And so, and unfortunately, Polson, there's just no capabilities to offer hybrid. So we're going to relocate that. And we did this last year at town campus. I think there's just this hangover because we used to always have these in the auditorium. And now we're trying to move everything to hybrid and then we would host it at town campus. Um, any qu additional questions? So we just, this was just kind of a, a correction to that. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, great. Um, item number 14 um, is discuss and take action to amend the 2024-25 budget workshop schedule, moving the April 16th, 2024 budget public hearing to Thursday, April 18th, 2024 at 7 p.m. at Town Campus, 8 Campus Drive, Room C, Hammond Asset Room, and on Zoom. Moved. Okay, um, so this is basically, I guess there was a conflict that the Board of Finance chair had with the date when the uh, public hearing was set. Um, it had been set for, I think, that Tuesday. Um, and now um, he's requested that we move it to Thursday. And um, so this is the this is really the, the Board of Finance public hearing with the, you know, before they uh, finalize the budget. Any questions, concerns? No? Okay, all in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. All right, passes unanimously. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Oh, so now we're just actually, why do we have this on here twice? Discussion, what's the difference? 
discuss item number 15 is discuss and take action. Oh, to move the meeting now. Wait, why would we do this? This is really, I guess, because it's a workshop, both boards still have to approve it. Okay. Discuss and take action to amend the 2024-25 budget workshop schedule, moving the April 16th, 2024 Board of Finance budget workshop meeting to Thursday, April 18th, immediately following the budget public hearing at Town Campus 8 Campus Drive, Room C, Room, uh, room and on Z Zoom. I moved. Second. Okay. All right, great. Uh, all in favor, say aye. Aye. All right, so this was actually just moving the Board of Finance meeting too, but since it's a workshop meeting, I guess we both approve it. So um, item number 16, um, discuss and take action to approve the disposition of two police department vehicles no longer in service per the disposition of town property policy. Moved. Second. Okay, any further questions? All in nope. favor, say aye. 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 Okay, great. Item number 16 passes. Item number 17, uh, discuss and take action to approve the following appointments and reappointments. A, Art Simmons to Madison Youth and Family Services for a term expiring on January 1, 2025. B, Steve Fabian is municipal agent for the elderly for a term expiring on 12-31-25. Uh, C, Amy Stefanowski to the Police Commission for a term expiring on January 1, 2028. Um, and D, reappointment of Craig Trailer as tree warden for a term expiring on 12-31-2025. Well, I'll move. You got a second? Second. I can second it. Okay, oh. great. Um, so I just, uh, um, normally I know these are in the consent agenda. I just wanted to pull this out just to highlight. Um, I think one of the pro process we went through at the end of the year is normally when terms expire at the end of the year, um, we get lists from both parties um, ahead of time, you know, for for replacements for those people. If somebody is term expires at the end of the year, they notify the party and they say they don't want to step stay on anymore. And then the parties know that there's going to be a vacancy and then they make a recommendation to fill it. And we realized that process didn't really have an opening for unaffiliated people so that it kind of just went right to the parties and the parties would replace it. And no one would really know about the vacancies on the boards and commissions. And um, so I just wanted to highlight to the public that the board already had talked about, we have, we're, we're I think we, we don't really have a clear path for people who are unaffiliated to get into a lot of these boards and commissions. And the board is really committed to looking at that. And I think the, the historically we relied on the political parties to make recommendations. And then, um, and then we typically would follow the recommendations of the political parties. I think it's become more and more apparent over the last couple of years, we have a large unaffiliated block that don't want to go through political parties. And then sometimes the way the expirations of the seats happen, the public doesn't actually know that there's going to be an opening on something. And the parties kind of have an advantage because it's one of their members who then tell them. So I just think it's, um, I wanted to highlight that we're conscious that um, there is you know, a desire by a lot of unaffiliated to serve. Um, and that the board is going to be spending the next couple of months really looking hard at the whole appointment process that we go through. And we might come up with some very different uh, ideas based on what we've done historically. Um, and so that's why I just wanted to pull this out to make sure that we highlight in public that we're thinking this through. We got some great unaffiliated candidates that did apply for some of these appointments. And um, unfortunately, the timelines didn't add up you know, based on what the political parties had already recommended. So we were kind of in a quandary, like, what do we do? You know, do we, you know, set aside past practice and do something different? And I think we recognize that there's just not a pathway that suits people who don't want to go through a political party. So um, so this isn't targeted any specific individual or anything like that. I just wanted to highlight that we're conscious that we need to rethink the appointment process. And that was all. Yeah, I, so I think just to, know, just to just to amplify and 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 in yeah. an agreement with with you, Peggy, um, uh, if if anyone has ever had to sit through an interview that I've been on, um, you've probably heard me say that it is the spirit of volunteerism in, in Madison that is, in my opinion, the special sauce that makes this a great town, um, and we absolutely recognize that. There is um, actually the the majority of residents are in fact unaffiliated, and uh, Al and I have have picked up the 
the mantle of of trying to craft a um, a process and policy that the board can consider, and um, and and we're working on that um, diligently. Um, in the meantime, um, we do have vacancies, and if you are a citizen that that wishes to volunteer and you see a vacancy, which you can see online, and you're worried about approaching a party, reach out to one of us and 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 talk to us about it. Um, we can help you navigate that. And I will say both town committees, the Democrat town committee and the Republican town committee have a history of moving unaffiliated candidates forward. Um, and uh, you shouldn't be afraid of, of the politics at large when it comes to volunteers in Madison, but should you be? And should it be your true desire not to go through that, talk to us, we'll help you navigate that and then hopefully in the very near future, we're going to have a pathway uh, documented and crafted that um, will, will make this process even simpler. I mean, I think the end game to, to what you're saying, Bruce, is we want to we want to make sure it's you know open to everybody and that we're getting the best candidates for the right roles um, and tapping into the full full community. So I, it's it's I'm excited that we're we're taking taking this on and uh, and hopefully addressing it for everybody. Yeah, and I think that um, you know the the town committees, ninety nine percent of the time it is not very political. They provide a um, process that helps the board because we just don't have the time or resources to do all this vetting. So they do a lot of hard work. Their nominations share do a lot, a lot of hard work. They do, you know, interviews and they, and they vet and they, you know, so they've worked hard, but at the same point, um, the bottom line is they're political, you know, they're political entities and, and a lot of unaffiliated people just don't want to have to go through a political entity to, to serve their community. Um, and so I think that's, you know, how we're going to, try to, to work on this and make it better. And we'll look at what other communities do too. And I think there, Bruce has kind of found some good examples, um, you know, um, and other places that we can look to to kind of improve the process. So um, so for those unaffiliated who have, you know, been maybe frustrated through this, we, we hear you and, and you know, we're recognizing that we need to, um, or if you're a Democrat or Republican who just don't, you know, you might be a registered Democrat, but you might, or Republican, but might, might not really want to go through a political process either. Um, you know, we hear that and we're looking to improve it. So, and we're also very grateful for everybody who steps up to volunteer uh, to serve the community. Um, so with that, I guess I'm all in favor of approving the appointments and reappointments as stated uh, on the agenda, say aye. Yeah. Aye. Aye. Okay, great. All right. All right, great. Well, thank you. And I guess we're moving on to item number 18, which is citizens comments. Um, if we have any hands raised um, from the public, Jeannie? I do not see it. Oh, wait. Yes, there is one. Hold on. Okay, uh, state your name and your address, please. Amy Thomas. Hi, um, Amy Thomas. I live at 34 River Ridge Farms Road. And um, I just wanted to, um, I'm sort of following uh, Fran and his presentation. Um, and so I want to thank him for um for the very thoughtful and thorough presentation that he shared, um, as well as um, the responses from everyone there. I'm kind of uh, very heartened to hear, um, you know, both both the reception to the ideas presented and, and understand the concerns. Um, and just want to, you know, reinforce the idea that I think this is a great opportunity for Madison to sort of take a leadership role. Um, you know, there are other towns and cities in Connecticut that are actually applying for grants to plant trees. Um, you know, it, it, it's a natural resource that we we really owe to ourselves and our and our uh, land to preserve. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just, it's a great opportunity to be in a leadership um, position to do that. 
and you know more than just regulating the removal to proactively preserve them and to celebrate them and to educate our community um you know about their importance on many levels um first and foremost the climate climate change and and what we're facing um and and of course just the the enjoyment of them the the beauty and character that they do bring to the town so um yeah in short just just speaking as one of the um concerned and um passionate citizens that was mentioned earlier um i'm, I'm following this with with great interest and and hope great thank you very much for your comments much appreciated we look forward to moving forward any other hands raised uh, fran yes. yeah hi yep. um I, just to warn you guys that there's a lot of activity regarding the nips to actually ban the nip so that uh, if you are going to make a budget line item, um, don't make it permanent. <laughs> if if people are successful, uh, that cash flow hopefully will disappear, but not in the next five, maybe in five, five, 10 years. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other hands raised, uh, Jeannie? Going once... Going twice. Yes, there is a hand. Okay. Oh, yeah. I know, Scott, you had a hard stop. If you need to drop off, uh, uh, feel free. Thank you, Colin. Please state your name and address. Hi, uh, Colin Sterling. I'm unmuted, right? Yep. Hi, Colin yep. Sterling, uh, 122 River Edge Farms Road. Um, and I just, yeah, I'm going to proceed, right? Yeah. Excuse Great. me. Okay, <laughs> just making sure I I, I can speak. Um, sure. Yeah, I, ju I just wanted to to thank Fran for his presentation. I am uh, a, a resident who's uh, who's concerned about the um, you know what what we've seen with with tree removal. Um, we had an ins I, I my support for an ordinance uh, comes not just from what happened uh, with uh, the Oyster Club, uh, an establishment that that. Um, Aside from the clear cutting, I'm, I'm, you know, was excited to see, excited for more uh, dining options. That's that's close close by to us. Um, uh, but uh, but a, another incident near us uh, highlighted the need for for an ordinance with you know residents who buy new property and then clear cut the land. And there are you know with wetlands rules, that's not always um, that's not always allowed. And so. Uh, an ordinance that reminds, you know, the tree companies, including folks from outside towns that come in, as was the case in this case, could have helped, uh, you know, preserved, you know, 10 or 12 um, decades old trees. It, it, it just it, it would have given a, a check to, um, you know, to people to, to avoid the process of having to go back through planning and zoning and and uh, and and doing a remediation plan. And in the case of the Oyster Club. Uh, I understand that the the owner didn't do anything out of bounds. Um, what I'm hoping is that this push for an ordinance and further rules would have uh, added a step in the process. And, and certainly, we don't want the process to get things that we want, like restaurants or you know other uh, sustainable development, uh, affordable housing, et cetera, that that we would love. Um, we we don't want to you know turn that into an, an endless spiral. But it it would have been nice. Uh, and I'm hoping that uh, tree productions going forward would have added a step where, uh, you know, after every agency in the state came in and said, well, these need to go for this reason, and these need to go for this reason, and these need to go for the septic, um, what we ended up with, maybe we could have realized, oh, maybe there's an alternative solution for the septic, maybe this can go here, or we can route things here, and these trees here can be preserved. Um, and and I think it, it would have really... Um, you know, it, it would have really helped. I understand the area will be replanted, um, in, but it will never, never be quite the same. Um, so I'll end it there. Uh, I, I appreciate Fran's presentation. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, share these thoughts and I'll be uh, joining in further sessions on this. Great, thank you very much for your comments. Um, one last time, any other hands raised from the public? There are not. Okay, with that, I guess hearing no objections, um, meeting is adjourned. Have a great, uh, enjoy the snow guys, <laughs> okay?